Welcome to this lecture on nuclear reactor kinetics. In this lecture, we will derive an expression for the time-dependent behavior of nuclear reactors in the absence of feedback effects. My name is Jan Kloosterman and I work at the Faculty of Applied Sciences of Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. When a uranium-235 nucleus absorbs a neutron, in 9 out of 10 cases it will fission in two fragments, called the fission products. Because heavy elements like uranium contain, relatively to the number of protons in the nucleus, a larger number of neutrons than lighter elements, there is a surplus of neutrons after the fission event. That's why on average about 2.45 neutrons are released after fissioning of uranium-235. The neutrons are released promptly and are therefore called the prompt fission neutrons. However, a very small number of the fission products will also emit a neutron after decay. This is shown in the diagram in which the fission product bromium-87 decays with half-life of 55 seconds to krypton-87 in an excited state, which in 2% of the cases decays to krypton-86 with the emission of a neutron. This means that a very small number of neutrons released in the fission process are actually released a few seconds after the fission event itself. These neutrons are called delayed neutrons. For uranium-235, the average delay time is about 13 seconds. Fission products that emit a neutron in a decay chain are called precursors. By definition, each precursor atom emits one delayed neutron in the decay chain. The number of delayed neutrons in the fission process of uranium-235 equals on average about 0.017, which is a very small number compared to the number of prompt neutrons of about 2.45. The fraction of delayed neutrons of uranium-235 is only 0.65% as shown in red on the slide. The table shown shows the split up of the precursor in six families, but sometimes in other data sets eight families are used. The half-life of the precursors of uranium-235 range from 0.18 to 55 seconds, and the latter is mainly due to the decay of the bromium to krypton that we've seen before. On average, it takes about 13 seconds until the delayed neutron is emitted. To derive the so-called point kinetics equations, we start with the one-group time-dependent neutron diffusion equation for a neutron flux phi. The v on the left-hand side of this equation is a neutron velocity, while the first term on the right-hand side of this equation is a neutron leakage rate in diffusion theory with a capital D, the neutron diffusion coefficient. The second term is a neutron absorption rate with sigma a, the macroscopic absorption cross-section, and the third term is a neutron production rate due to fission, with sigma f, the macroscopic fission cross-section, and nu, the total number of neutrons per fission event. Note that nu is a sum of the prompt and delayed neutrons per fission. The resultant of these three terms determine if the neutron flux increases or decreases in time, or remains stationary. To solve this equation, we need boundary conditions. For a bare geometry, this is given in the fusion theory by putting the flux to zero at a linearly extrapolated boundary. We also need initial conditions. This implies that the neutron flux should be given at some time t, here indicated with time t is zero. Here the time-dependent diffusion equation is shown again, but now with the diffusion coefficient in the first term on the right-hand side before the divergence term. This is valid if the composition of the reactor core is homogeneous. In the derivation of the point kinetics equations, we also assume that the flux in the reactor core is in the fundamental mode. This implies that the leakage term can be rewritten in terms of the geometrical buckling as shown in red in equation 2. In this equation we have also integrated the neutron flux over the whole volume of the reactor core. 
This total new reflux is indicated with capital Phi and is only depending on time. Now we must realize that the production of neutrons in a fission process consists of the prompt neutrons released promptly at the fission event and the decay of precursor atoms. The prompt neutron production rate equals nu p times the macroscopic fission cross-section times the total neutron flux and is shown in red in equation 3. As said before, each precursor atom releases one delayed neutron upon decay. This term is shown in blue in equation 3. Of course, we need an additional equation to evaluate the number of precursor atoms in the reactor core as a function of time. This is shown in the second equation on this slide, where the red term describes the production of precursor atoms, which is pro proportional to the fission rate in the core, and the blue term describes the removal of precursor atoms due to decay. Of course, when a precursor atom decays, a delayed neutron is produced because by definition each precursor atom produces exactly one delayed neutron upon decay. <coughs> we now recast the fission term in the first equation a bit by adding and subtracting nu d times the macroscopic fission cross section on the right hand side. On the next slide, we will convert each term containing the total neutron flux to the total fission neutron production rate, which is shown in blue on the, at the bottom of this slide. The total neutron production rate is proportional to the fission rate in the core and therefore also to the total power produced in the core. This set of equations are the same as on the previous slide, but now with the total neutron flux converted to the fission neutron production rate in the core. The term in red on the left hand side of the equation is called the neutron generation time and is a prompt neutron lifetime L divided by the effective multiplication factor K effective and has a meaning of the average time needed for a neutron to create one new fission neutron. The red color term on the right hand side can be rewritten using the reactivity of the reactor core. To derive an expression for the reactivity, we first divide the red terms by the macroscopic absorption cross section and then by 1 plus L squared B squared. These are the blue parts in the equation at the bottom of the slide. In other lectures on the criticality condition of bare homogeneous reactor cores, we have demonstrated that the blue parts represents the non-leakage probability of the reactor core. Furthermore, we can rewrite the ratio of the production rate of neutrons and the absorption rate of neutrons as a multiplication factor of an infinitely large reactor core, also called K-infinite. And finally, we can rewrite the product of the infinite multiplication factor and the non-leakage probability as the effective multiplication factor of the reactor core. Using these formulations, we see that the reactivity of the reactor core equals the ratio of the effective multiplication factor minus 1 divided by the effective multiplication factor. In the equations, we see also the ratio of the production of precursor atoms, nu d times the macroscopic fission cross section, and the total neutron production efficient neutron production shown in red on this slide. This ratio is called the delayed neutron fraction and is usually given the symbol beta. Note that the precursor atoms only emit a delayed neutron several seconds after the fission event itself. The equations on this slide give the point kinetics equations for one family of precursors. It's a coupled set of equations, one for the fission neutron production rate P and one for the precursor atoms C. In case we want to include more families of precursors in our point kinetics equation, we have to include each family separately and also write a balance equation for each family. This is shown in the set of equations at the bottom of the slide. The number of families can be 6 or 8.
From this set of point kinetics equations, we can derive the effective decay constant when we lump all precursor families into one. First know that the red term in each equation for the fission neutron production rate B need to be equal to each other. From this we can extract the equality shown in red. Secondly, in a stationary reactor, the total number of precursor atoms does not change in time. Using this, we can derive the equation in blue. And from this, we can derive the final expression for the decay constant lambda in case we have only one family of precursors. If we insert the values for beta and lambda for each precursor family of uranium-235, as shown on slide 4 of this presentation, we can get for lambda a value of 0.08 per second. And this means that on average a delayed neutron is emitted 13 seconds after the fission event. This is 1 divided by lambda. It's interesting to calculate the number of precursor atoms in the fuel and to compare these with the number of neutrons in the reactor core. Assuming a stationary situation, we can derive from the second equation an expression for the precursor atoms as shown on the slide. Inserting the expression for P0, which is a stationary fission neutron production rate in the reactor core, we get that the number of precursors in the fuel is beta divided by the decay constant of the lumped precursor family divided by the neutron generation time, times the number of neutrons in the reactor core. Because the neutron generation time can be of the order 10 minus 5, the resulting number is typically much smaller than unity, which means that the fuel contains many more precursor atoms than the number of free neutrons in the reactor core. Now we will solve the point kinetics equations for a step function and the reactivity of the core. Assume the reactivity increases with the value of rho 1 at time t0. We will try to find a solution by inserting an exponential function for p and c as shown on the slide. And this leads to the set of coupled equations with s as a parameter as shown in equation 2. Inserting the equation for c into the first equation for p, we get an expression for p as shown in equation 3. Note that this equation has only a non-trivial solution if the polynomial in S equals 0. Here we have given the same polynomial again. The two roots of this second order equation can easily be found. We can simplify the solution a bit by restricting ourselves to smaller activity steps. This means that rho 1 is much smaller than beta and assuming that the generation time is very small compared to beta minus rho 1. We then obtain the result for the two roots S1 and S2 as shown at the bottom of the slide. Here we've shown the expression for the roots S1 and S2 again. Approximating the root with the first term of the Taylor expansion, we can get the final values of S1 and S2 as shown on the slide. For small values of the reactivity, S1 is almost proportional to the reactivity and it has always the same sign as the reactivity. While the value of S2 is always negative and because the generation time is generally very small, it always has a large negative value. The formula on this slide gives a final expression for the fission neutron production rate as a function of time after insertion of a constant reactivity rho 1 at time t0. In this plot, the two contributions are shown. The first term in blue is a root corresponding to S1. After a positive step in the reactivity, the fission neutron production rate jumps to a higher value and then increases exponentially afterwards. This is shown by the blue curve in the plot. The second term, corresponding to S2, is a small correction to the blue term. 
it corresponds to the response of the reactor due to the prompt neutrons. Note that if the generation time capital lambda would go to zero, meaning that the prompt neutrons would respond infinitely fast, the second term would not be visible in the plot anymore, and the response would be as shown in the blue curve alone. We will explain more about the point kinetics response with zero generation time if we discuss the prompt jump approximation. We have seen before that the point kinetics equation with only one group of precursor atoms lead to a second order equation in S and thus to a solution of the fission neutron production rate containing two exponential functions. If we would start with the point kinetics equations with n number of precursor families, we would end up with a polynomial in S of order n plus 1. This is shown in the red formula at the bottom of the slide. Here we have given the same polynomial again. Using the expression for the delayed neutral fraction, beta, as shown in black on the slide, we arrive at what is called in nuclear reactor physics the Inhauer equation. This equation is shown in blue at the bottom of the slide and defines the n plus 1 values of S if we insert a step in the reactivity equal to rho 1. On the next slide, we will show the right hand side of this expression and the cross point of this expression with the horizontal line of rho 1 gives the n plus 1 values of S. This plot shows the roots of the NR equation for six families of precursors. The roots are the cross points of the horizontal red line, which is the reactivity introduced with the curves of the right hand side of the NR equation. Note that for six families of precursor atoms, the solution of the NR equation counts seven roots in total. First note that the reactivity can never exceed the value of unity. This means that the branch of the NR equation at the top left corner of the curve can never be reached. This region would actually correspond to a negative value of the multiplication factor, which is physically impossible. Only S1 has the same sign as the reactivity in insertion itself. This is the blue curve on the right. All other S values are always negative, and a corresponding exponential function in the solution for the power will always die out faster than the exponential function with S1. The larger the reactivity insertion, the larger the value of S1 will be, and the faster the, the power will increase. Theoretically, there is no limit on S1 at a positive side. Note, however, that the value of S1 for negative values is restricted. S1 can never cross the value of minus lambda 1, which is a decay constant of the longest lived precursor atoms. This is logical. After a strong negative reactivity insertion, the precursors will continue to emit delayed neutrons, and after all short lived precursors have decayed, only the longest lived precursors will dominate the time dependence of the reactor power. The long term response of the reactor is then proportional to exponent S1t. We can express this also in the reactor period capital T as shown in a formula at the bottom of the slide. We will now examine the limit of small reactivity insertions. Assuming that the reactivity inserted is much smaller than beta, the resulting magnitude of the S value will be much smaller than the lambda 1 value. It is then easily seen that the reactor period capital T equals the effective neutron generation time, which is the neutron generation time including the effect of delayed neutrons, divided by the reactivity insertion, rho 1. This is approximately equal to the effective neutron lifetime divided by k minus 1. For very large values of the reactivity insertion, corresponding to values of the reactivity much larger than beta, the S value is very large and positive. Because the reactor is now super critical on prompt neutrons alone, 
it's in what we call the prompt supercritical state. In this case, the rector period equals the prompt neutron lifetime L divided by K minus 1 and will in practice reach very small values, because L can be of the order of 1 to 10 microseconds. For sure, after such a large reactivity insertion, the reactor power will increase very rapidly. Here we've shown the reactor period, which is the inverse of S1, versus the inserted reactivity. Note that we have given here the reactivity divided by the value of the delayed neutron fractions, which is usually called the reactivity expressed in units of dollar. A reactivity of unity now corresponds to the value at which the reactor is critical on prompt neutrons alone. For small values of reactivity, left of the blue dotted line, the reactor period becomes very large, which implies that the reactor will react mildly to the reactivity inserted. In this region, the reactor is easy to control, and automatic feedback effects, like the nuclear Doppler effect, will easily and automatically compensate for the inserted reactivity. In this range, the reactor is called delayed supercritical, and this is of course the only safe region to operate a nuclear reactor. For values of the reactivity larger than one dollar, the reactor becomes supercritical on prompt neutrons alone and the reactor power will increase very rapidly. The reactor period now depends strongly on the neutron generation time and for small values of the, the reactor period becomes extremely small. This means the reactor will be very difficult to control and in some cases the automatic feedback effects like the nuclear Doppler effect might not be able to compensate for the inserted reactivity. On slide 19 of this presentation, we discussed the solution of the reactor power with one lumped family of precursor atoms in play, with a positive reactivity step. We saw that the solution was made up of a positive contribution and a small correction to it with a negative sign. The negative part was a function of the neutron generation time and became zero quickly after the reactivity inserted. Here we will take a look into the solution of the power in case the generation time gets a very small value near to zero. On the slide, the point kinetics equations are given for one lumped precursor family. And if the neutron generation time capital lambda goes to zero, the reactor power makes a step. Here indicated with the heavy side function. This means that the derivative of the reactor power just before and just after the reactivity insertion is zero, as shown in the figure. As a result, after a step in reactivity, the power increase is proportional to the ratio of beta minus rho after and before the reactivity step. This is shown in the red formula in the box and is called the prompt jump approximation to the solution of the point kinetics equations. In this lecture, we have presented the point kinetics equations and we found an expression for the reactor period characterizing the change in power of the nuclear reactor. In reality, the dynamics of a nuclear reactor will not follow the, de the derived kinetics behavior due to the automatic feedback effects. Imagine we have a nuclear reactor core with a fission neutron production rate P as a function of time, with the reactivity as input. Because the fission neutron production rate and the heat production rate in the core are linearly related to each other, we can easily express the heat produced in the reactor core as a function of P. A change in heat production leads via a thermohydraulics model to a change in the temperature of the fuel and moderator. Through the nuclear Doppler effect for the fuel temperature and the dependence of the macroscopic cross-section on the density of the moderator, the reactivity of the reactor core depends on the fuel and moderator temperature as, as well. And the blue alpha terms in the box are called the reactivity feedback coefficients and can be defined for the fuel temperature, for the moderator temperature, but also for the temperature of structural materials, the coolant and other agents, if needed. When the change in temperature changes the reactivity, 
the power of the nuclear reactor will change as well. Clearly, when the value of the reactivity feedback coefficients are negative, the reactivity of the reactor will always automatically return to zero and the reactor will reach a new stationary state. We will finalize this lecture with a number of conclusions. First, we've seen that a very small fraction of the fission neutrons is emitted by decay of precursor atoms, and this fraction is released about 13 seconds after the fission event. For a large range of operating conditions, these delayed neutrons lead actually to a very mild response of a nuclear reactor. And the point kinetics equations derived here describe the fission power and the precursor concentrations in the reactor core. After a reactivity step and in the absence of feedback effects, the reactor power increases or decreases exponentially in time with the reactor period T. In reality, feedback effects will take care of the reactor response such that the reactor power stabilizes again. Thank you for your attention and if you have further questions, please contact us at one of the websites shown here.